Hello everybody, this is Gregory with 5-Minute Catholic Apologetics and Living, where 5 minutes of your time may get you to the divine. Today we're going to talk about and look at the endings of all four Gospels to elaborate and expound upon the idea that Christ never commanded anybody to write down what he did. Now before we begin, let's start with a prayer. Namun Patris et Filii et Spiritu Sancti. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filii et Spiritu Sancto. Secutera in principio et nuc et semper et de seculi seculorum. Amen. So I will put a banner in for some of the episodes where we discuss and refute Bible alone or Sola Scriptura. And I think discussing the ending of each of the, Osc- uh, each of the Gospels kind of undermines the idea of one of the corollaries of Bible alone is everything that you need for Christian living must be found in the Bible. I mean, the, the main way to undercut that is nowhere in the, in the New Testament does it say that the, the kind of the, the guide for Christian living is the Bible. This idea of Bible alone really developed with the Protestant arch heretics of the 16th century. And prior to that, nobody had this kind of incomplete, non holistic view of how to live your life, how to approach the scriptures and how to approach our Christian living. By the way, let's get to the four endings of the Gospels because, you know, I've jokingly said in the past, when Christ was ascending into heaven, he wasn't you know, throwing out Gideon Bibles with the table of contents and verses. The, the, the table of contents, the chapters, the verses, these were all medieval, medieval period uh, innovations. But it's not like he was passing out the, the New Testament and said, you know, this is the guidebook. This is what you need to follow the rest of your life. No, it was none of those things. So let's just get to it. So let's get to Matthew chapter 28, the very end, verse 16, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you to the close of the age. Notice that's where we get also for baptism, the, the kind of the script for it. You have to, to baptize the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But what does he say? Preach, 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 make disciples, preach, preach, baptize, preach, preach. Then you go to Mark, Mark 16, verse 20. Oh, verse 15, I said, Go into all the, the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. All these signs will accompany you to believe in my name, they'll cast out demons, and so forth. But again, preach, 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 preach. Luke. Chapter 24, verse 44. These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, and everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture and said to them, This is what is written, that the Christ should suffer on the third day from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached, preached, preached in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are the witness of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Then you look at John. John's repeated to have two endings. And I should have mentioned that about Mark as well, the original ending, and then an ending that either the evangelist wrote or a disciple of the evangelist wrote. But either way, we can look at John 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Then if you look at John 21, verse 25, the actual last verse of John. But there are many other things which Jesus did, every which one of them, if they were written, I suppose the world itself cannot contain the books that would be written. All right, so what's the point of looking at these things? So the early church did not have the New Testament. And in fact, if you look, the first epistles written by Paul which are probably the earliest of the New Testament, was written probably starting in, in the 50s, 50s AD. And then the, the, the majority of the New Testament was then written in the next 15 years, with the Gospel of John Revelation probably being the last things that were written near the end of the century. So you look at at least one to two generations that didn't have the New Testament. So how could 
how could the Bible, like where in the Bible is this, where in the Bible, how could that have been the, the rubric that they used if the New Testament didn't exist for the first two generations? And we have an episode here how the Mass existed before the New Testament, that, uh, that the Mass was being done by early Christians, the breaking of the bread, so to speak. You see it, of course, in the Last Supper, but you also see it in the, in the, the, the Supper of Emmaus, the Road to Emmaus, and then you see Paul talk about in 1 Corinthians 11. The early church had the spoken word, oral tradition. Christ tells everybody to preach. So in all the fledgling and co Christian communities at the time, they would have small communities and either apostles or disciples of the apostles would preach. And you saw the kind of prototype of, of the mass. They would preach and then they would do the breaking of the bread. But they would preach and talk about the stories of Jesus and, and so forth and, and, and different Christian teaching. And then eventually some of these things it was prudent to do so were written down the majority of it written by the evangelists particular luke wrote two major works and then of course paul wrote the large majority of the epistles and so some of these things were written down to complement the oral tradition from which the early church benefited and the early church used so the bible as we've talked about is a tripod of three two other things you have sacred oral tradition from which the bible the new testament emanates so if you ever malign sacred oral tradition you're essentially maligning the bible because the bible came from oral tradition and even john talks about it. these are just some of the things of the exploits of jesus christ just some of the things and then the other tripod is going to a part of the tripod is the magisterium which we've had since the early church you can see demonstrated in the council of jerusalem you can see that talked about in acts 15 where there was one central authority and there was always intended, Christ intended a visible church on Peter. You see this played out in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. And he gave them, he gave them the power to bind and unbind and, and so forth. And so there was an authority. So anytime that there was issues or controversies, you went to the living authority. You see this played out with the early heresies. You see this played out on the Council of Jerusalem. Do converts need to be circumcised and follow Mosaic law? So there always has to be a living and authority to interpret and decipher that. Decipher that. Because when you don't have that, you have denominationalism, what we have today. I'm going to read the Bible and I'm going to interpret it this way. Why is my way the right way? Because I think it's the right way. Because you could say the Holy Spirit is moving me to, be that, to feel this way. But then you can't have conflicting, contradictory versions. Of, of Christianity. The Holy Spirit cannot err. So there's only one, one official view of everything, so to speak. And Christ said he persevered to the end, that he would protect the church uh, forever to the, to the end of time. And so understand that Jesus didn't ever tell anybody to write these things down. Of course, being the hypostatic union, being God, he knew that these things were gonna be written down. But his prime directive to his apostles, which were the first bishops, he initiated that in the Last Supper, was to preach, to preach and baptize and perform works. Preach, baptize, preach, 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 preach. It wasn't to write things down. And then certainly it wasn't like the New Testament, the future New Testament. Or He, he could have, I mean, if, if he had really intended Sola Scriptura, he would have said, write everything down. And make sure you teach everybody that the future works will be the definitive guide to Christian living. Of course he didn't say that because that was not his intention. That was not his intention. He never told anybody to write anything down. That's not to undermine sacred scripture, in particular the New Testament, but it's a fact. He didn't tell anybody to write it down. So the, 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 the ancient faiths, and particularly the Orthodox and certainly the Catholics, Eastern Catholics, Western Latin Catholics, it doesn't matter, whichever right have the kind of the holistic view of how scripture is to be used and scripture is exceedingly important no doubt but it's not the definitive guide to christian living it was never intended that to understand our christian doctrine and i mean the easiest way to understand it is go to the, the catechism because the, the church and its prudence and its wisdom has created the catechism for us to understand the various teachings of Holy Mother Church. And if you're more of an auditory person, Father Schmitz over Ascension has the Bible in a year podcast, if that works better than, than actually reading. 
uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the catechism in a year. If that's easier for you than actually reading the catechism, because the catechism can be dense. We've talked about how the Baltimore catechism, I think, was a, a, maybe not as a fully fleshed, nuanced catechism, but I think it was a more approachable catechism. But if that works for you, the, the podcast, that's great. But understand the more holistic view of Christian living and how a lot of it stems, if all of it stems from sacred oil tradition, and then some of it is written down, and then you need a magisterium. It's no different than if you look at the Constitution. The Constitution was written down, but the Founding Fathers, in their judgment, realized that we need to have a visible form of leadership with the executive branch that executes the laws, the legislative branch, and then the Supreme Court. And what's the job of the Supreme Court? Is to decipher if something is aligned with the Constitution, to find if it's constitutional or not. So again, that's probably the best analogy, is you need a living authority to determine if something is consistent with the past, with the deposit of faith, with the intention of whatever, whoever created it. And so Christ initiated a visible church and he intended that church, that visible church, which started with Peter, and we have 266 popes, intended to always be present and to be able to exercise, and it's prudent, to safeguard the faith, protect the faith, interpret the faith, and so forth. You need a visible authority. So guys, I know this episode was a little long, Whitney, but either way, post in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, take care, God bless, and pray.